You're listening to episode 317, Resurrection Choices. Welcome to Transforming Missions Podcast, providing you with insights and resources you need to lead a movement of Jesus followers. Well, happy Easter, since we're now living in, in that season, and this episode might be your annual reminder that if you're brave enough, often enough, we're going to fail. <laughs> now, if that doesn't quite sound like a resurrection message, hang with us for just a moment, and I want to say thank you for that reminder, Brene Brown. Uh, Sarah, you're correct. The resurrection is a reminder that failure never has the last word. And in this final episode in the series of choices, let's explore a few resurrection choices as leaders. So, when I think about the resurrection at a very basic level, it's about new life. Take, for example, the image of a caterpillar emerging from a cocoon as a butterfly. There's new life. And Jesus, of course, emerging from the grave, there's new life. And in the same way, if we're truly resurrection people, and, and I hope we are, <laughs> I, I, I'm guessing you are, you wouldn't be listening, uh, we believe in the power of God to turn situations and circumstances, um, decisions and setbacks, defeats and mistakes, inside out and upside down to bring new life. Resurrection is ultimately about having hope. Being people of hope isn't about wishful thinking. Being people of hope means we proclaim and live as people who not only say the grave doesn't have the last word, but we live it. We lead from that place, and we share that hope with the people that we lead. So, Sarah, what I'm thinking is that as Jesus emerged from the grave, he emerged with new life. So whatever circumstances or situations you're facing, you can find new life too. Yes, it might take time or effort or energy or intentionality, but that's the story of the resurrection. And one of the things that I've learned from Brene Brown and her work is that the most resilient people have a process in place for learning to rise again. So as we think about being people of the resurrection or resurrection people, here's how I think about it. In some form or in some way, people who are resilient, people who are resurrection people, acknowledge that there was a mess up. There's a failure or a moment that tripped them up. And then they acknowledge the emotion that comes all around that, because there's always lots of emotion around those things, right? And then we look at the story within it and ask the lessons that we're learning from it. And then from there, and this is truly the resurrection part, if you will, the learning to rise part, we learn to lead and love and live differently. So, Sarah, I know we've talked about it before, but what is the process? So, there are three steps, the reckoning, the rumble, and the revolution. So, let's start with the reckoning. And this is where we walk into our own story and recognize the emotion that is around it and get curious about the feelings that are happening either currently or if you're considering something that's happened in the past, how they connect with the ways that we're thinking and behaving. Yeah, I've heard you say that many times that we're not taught to do this. So what are some things we need to keep in mind? Yeah, so here's why I say that many of us weren't taught to do this. I'm going to offer a few phrases and see which one of the following might ring true for you and how they resonate with you. The first one is, being, an, being emotional is a sign of vulnerability, and vulnerability is weakness. Number two, don't ask, don't tell. You can feel all the emotions you want, but there's nothing to be gained by sharing it with others. Number three, we don't have access to emotional language or a full emotional vocabulary, so we stay quiet or we make fun of it. Number four, Discussing emotion is frivolous, self-indulgent, and a waste of time. It's not for people like us. 
Number five, we're so numb to feelings that there's nothing to discuss. (laughs) Number six, uncertainty is too uncomfortable. And number seven, engaging and asking questions just invites trouble. How did you know that about my life, Sarah? (laughs) (laughs) I... I have listened to you say those things on more than one occasion, but now in terms of the resurrection and thinking about them, I have to confess that there were many years that that I didn't have connection with my emotions. So it was always a denial of those emotions. And some of the things that you've just listed actually went through my mind or through my heart because I was I thought I was protecting myself. And in the context of making choices as a leader, especially choices of resurrection, it seems to me that one of the most emotional things that I could do, if I put myself in the place of Simon Peter or John or any of the other disciples, that I'd walk to the tomb and look in and he's not there. It seems to me that what I'd want to do before I tried to get in touch with my own feelings, was just deny it it altogether. Somebody stole the body. It's not here. But then I get in touch with myself or with God as God is dealing with me. And the choice is to own those feelings and then have those feelings become the very power that, that rises up within in a positive way to be the leader God created me to be. I just think it's a way of shaping leadership. Does that make sense? Yeah, it absolutely makes makes sense and and I think as I think about the life of the life in ministry, so often we're moving quickly from one thing to the next. We're moving from one meeting to the next, one phone call, one interaction and something can happen. And there's not in that moment, like you were describing the disciples, of standing at the grave and recognizing what's going on. And then the other moment to ask not only what is going on around me, but what is happening within me. And I think sometimes we just fast forward right through that and move on to the next thing. And what we don't recognize in that is we have a hard time finding that resurrection hope because we're still carrying all of that. We're still carrying what happened in that moment. We we haven't named it. We haven't dealt with it. We haven't even acknowledged it in many cases. And so it just starts to get all wrapped up inside of us. And I'm not a psychologist or a social worker or a, a therapist. I'm just saying this is a moment of being able to name what we're feeling and going beyond the I'm mad, sad, or glad descriptions to something a little bit deeper will help all of us continue to live into being people of hope and being people who truly embrace and live as people of resurrection. I'm always uh, grateful that we, that you remind me of that. So thank you. Are we, are we ready to, may I do it this way, ready to rumble? <laughs> uh, are we ready to move on to the rumble? Sure. And and the rumble is really about owning that story. So once you've named the emotion and got clear about what is happening in that moment in terms of what you're feeling, the rumble is where we get honest about the stories we're making up, about the struggle, about what is happening in that moment. and And often... It, I, you know, I'm thinking of my silly example of moving from one meeting to the one meeting to a next or one phone call to the next, and you hang up the phone and you're like, "What? What was that? <laughs> you know, did did I not hear them correctly? Was I being rude? You know, you you start to make up stories. It's what we do when there's uncertainty. That's this is where I like to say, you know what? Human beings are really creative. We just don't always claim that we're creative, and so. In the midst of the rumble, you're challenging the assumptions to determine what is the truth. 
what what in those in that story is really about self protection, and what needs to change if you want to lead in a mo- more wholehearted way or be a person of of hope. Sorry, I just the thing that comes to mind is self awareness, um, a healthy self awareness, and then I think, man, if we could just be self aware in relationship to the resurrection, what a change that would make. There's a there's another one of these in the process. So let's talk about, and I like this one too. I'll just use the initials SFD. Let's talk about that. The Stormy First Draft. <laughs> yes, this is the rated G version of what that is. So the the Stormy First Draft, when when you're trying to rumble, how you do that is by First, choosing choosing a place where there's been a misstep, a fall, a disappointment, a failure, a setback that you were trying to work through. So in, in the midst of that, it might be something that's happening right in this moment when, when I was experiencing the training for Dare to Lead with Brene Brown. She suggested that people do this every day. And I thought, I'm exhausted just thinking about doing <laughs> doing this every day. But the reason why she suggested that, and there's there's power in this, is that if it's truly going to become practice, and if you're truly going to write a new ending and rise strong, you do need to continue practicing it. It's not a one and done a not not a one and done thing. We interact with people all day, every day. And so there's gonna be moments maybe it's just me, but I mean, <laughs> there's usually something at the end of every day that I'm like, okay, that was just weird. Or I don't know what happened there or what went on or gosh, I'm glad that's over. You know, whatever it might, whatever it might be. So in writing your SFD, the first thing to do is to choose an experience. Again, this is a disappointment, a failure, a setback, or someplace that there's a misstep in your leadership. So just let me say back, is, is this where we're considering the feelings, thoughts, and behaviors during the moment, the experience? Yes, that's exactly what you're doing. And there are prompts that can be shared to work through this, but the the most simple way that I can think about I think about it and invite people to think about it is just free, and this is literally getting out a pen and writing. <laughs> You know, the free write, the most authentic, honest, unfiltered, and unedited version of what you are thinking. And it might even be unshareable about what happened in that moment. That's the reason it's called a stormy first draft, right? Correct. So what you've just done is to put on paper the story you were telling yourself about a hard moment of failure or a setback. Exactly. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying back to you what I hear you say. Exactly. That that is it. And there's one more one more step in the process because we don't want to stop there. And I say that intentionally because I think we often do, whether it's in journaling or, you know, talking to a friend about it, that's often where we stop. We tell the story, we verbal vomit, we vent, whatever it might be. But if there's really going to be a resurrection, if there's really going to be new life, a new way of leadership, you've got to make the process a practice. So in the revolution, this is where you're writing a new ending to the story based on your key learnings from your rumble. And then you're going to use this new braver story to change how you engage with the world and ultimately transform the way that we live, that we love, that you might parent and especially lead. So am I remembering that there's something called the Delta, what we learned during the rumble when we compare the story we made up with the truth? Yes. And you, you just nailed it. The Delta is the difference. If you remember from your days in math class, the delta is the difference, right? So by rumbling with our stories, we can find wisdom and meaning in the delta. And so the end of the process, 
there are a few things that you're identifying. You're identifying what are your key learnings. You're looking to see if there's any common themes in what your go-to, if you will, SFDs are. Sometimes what you'll find if you do this more than once, and again, I'd encourage you to do it more than once, is there's something that you're always saying. That's what I mean by common themes. Um, And then pausing to ask yourself, how has working through the reckoning, the rumble, and the revolution changed you? And the most important part is, what's that brave new ending? What's the ending that brings hope? What's the, what's the resurrection choice that you're making to live and lead in a new and different way? So with these three steps, you move from a story you're telling yourself about a hard moment or a mistake to interrogating the story for the truth to write a brave new ending. In that way, you're making a resurrection choice. Exactly. The point here is to get to the resurrection choice. You can choose to keep repeating the same story, or you can choose to write a brave new ending to that story to live with resurrection hope. Sarah, I've got lots of things running through my mind of how this process actually, I'm, I'm going to be a little dramatic here, could actually not only change the life of a leader, but it could actually change the world. And what I'm thinking about is, let's just take just the example of our relationships and there's someone who has hurt us or we feel like we've been hurt. And um, my stormy first draft is to begin to go to the worst place of that hurt and begin to talk about, not about how I'm hurt, but about how bad that person is and what they've done wrong. And if I'm, If I'm generous, as I've heard you say many times, if I'm generous with that person, I'm not just cutting them a break, but I'm actually looking at myself. I'm actually holding a mirror up to myself to see the reflection of reality, which allows me to become more self-aware and then to deal with truth rather than the stormy first draft I've made up. Right. Right. That sounds like putting the resurrection in a, in a way in which it transforms life. Oh, that's the point to the resurrection already. But this is a way you can do it with leadership. It's a way you can do it with everyday relationships. It's a way you can do it with, and, and the way you've talked about it today, you're just falling flat on your face. You're as embarrassed as you could ever be. How will you ever get over this? Well, I'm learning that the embarrassment comes from me more than it does with the people around me. Right. So uh, thank you. I, this is a, a good word um, for the week after uh, Easter. And oh, by the way, Easter just started. It's not over. <laughs> you have a whole season to live with resurrection hope and to make resurrection choices. <laughs> and And oh, guess what? You have a whole year. Because isn't that our reminder every Sunday that we're people of the resurrection? Okay, we could continue down that rabbit hole, but we won't. We'll simply say thank you for joining us for this last episode in the series on choices. As a reminder, you can find show notes at transformingmission.org forward slash 317. And remember, who you are is how you lead. Bye for now.